Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Albert Chen, who teach in this law school, and it's my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce to you the speaker uh, at this lunchtime seminar organized by the Center for Comparative and Public Law. Um, the speaker uh, is Professor Rikia Sakamoto, who is from the uh, from Nihon University in Tokyo. Uh, Professor uh, Sakamoto was educated uh, uh, in Nihon University itself and also Tulane uh, Tulane University uh, in the U.S. And uh, he has practiced uh, international commercial litigation uh, in the U.S. as a New York State licensed attorney. Um, and he has also been in practice as a foreign law attorney in Japan. Uh, he, he, before, he, he has been uh, teaching at uh, Nihon University College of Law uh, for, for a few years. Um, actually, 30. <laughs> <laughs> but just one yeah, uh, 15 years. 15 years. Yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, he's been teaching there since 2003. And uh, his areas of research uh, is very broad, uh, include not only international dispute resolution, arbitration, but also constitutional law, contract court, and civil procedure. So it is a great pleasure to be able to invite Professor Sakamoto to speak to us uh, today uh, on the very interesting topic on international arbitration in Japan and elsewhere. So welcome to uh, Professor Sakamoto. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Mr. Chen. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, send my uh, sincere appreciation to the Center for Comparative and Public Law for inviting me as a lecturer here. It's my uh, privilege and honor standing here and speak about international arbitration in front of you. Well, uh, also I'd like to uh, extend my uh, sincere gratitude to Professor Anselmo, uh, who is not present unfortunately, for arranging this kind of uh, event in a short notice. Uh, today, uh, we'd like to uh, share the view on uh, international arbitration in Japan. Uh, how many students or how many people or how many of you uh, actually study arbitration here or in other countries? Would you raise your hand, please? So you're experts, so, okay. I wish that I can get some feedback on the Japanese arbitration as you might well know, the Japanese arbitration is way behind the scene of the international business communities. Actually, the Hong Kong is recognized as a hub of international arbitration. They are trying to accommodate lots of culture, of the culturally based dispute resolution system, into the uh, regulatory scheme, which would make it workable uh, globally and also locally. So uh, from that point of view, I'd like to just uh, see how Japan stands in the current picture of the international business community and how Japan may serve as a, a dispute resolution place to the further development of global business. Um, before doing that, I'd like to just lay a foundation. For the purpose of my uh, speech or speak, I have a two terminology to share with you. First is that Western style international commercial arbitration. Uh, this is a modern arbitration which is originally developed in North American Europe. Most of the modern arbitration doctrine was developed in either in the United States, England, or France. And uh, uh, it resolves the dispute by applying law and so uh, basically, it is a rule of law based arbitration so that it necessarily contains or invites adversarial system which requires evidence gathering and evidence exchanging to prove on everything, prove facts on law. So this is a, a sort of the uh, litigation outside of the court. 
So I call it Western style of international commercial arbitration, sometimes WSICA. So this is the one terminology I'd like to share as foundation. Second one, which is called hybrid process. This is a not new concept, but uh, uh, this is sort of the, uh, getting attention lately from the Asian countries because uh, um, it reflects the settlement culture. It actually combines mediation into arbitration or it combines mediation with arbitration such as mid herb or ab mid herb. Mid herb serves as just providing a mediation service first. If the mediation doesn't work, then you proceed to arbitration. Arm with arm is now uh, concocted by the uh, Singapore International Commercial uh, in Singapore uh, International Arbitration Center, which also start with arbitration. Then they consent to mediate. Then, if mediation fails, they proceed into arbitration. This has two purposes, I think. First is to avoid judicialization of arbitration process. As arbitration process is a slow litigation process, it's similar to the technique of the um, litigation, uh, which would be very appreciated in the arbitration tribunal to some extent. But uh, it's not actually litigation. But so many lawyers who represent the uh, uh, claimant and respondent, they bring the technique they apply to court into arbitration without knowing that arbitration is a little bit different, uh, not quite similar to the uh, litigation. So that's going to uh, cause the arbitration costly, and sometimes it's called judicialization or Americanization of arbitration. But to some extent, it is actually necessary because it, adversary system offers something, you have to stick with the litigation technique so that uh, you have to allow some area of litigation technique to be involved in arbitration process. So to avoid judicialization, they employ hybrid process. The other one will be related to the cultural aspects, which would reflect the settlement culture. It actually attempts to create unified global way of dispute resolution that ideally workable through the world. So uh, I put that in the context of a cultural and practical convergence between the West and the East. So uh, two purpose for hybrid process, which I refer to uh, this, uh, I refer in this uh, speak, so that we share the Western style arbitration and hybrid process arbitration from these two perspectives we will just uh, explore the how or where Japan is located. Okay. Here is uh, where Japan is located. International commercial arbitration, this shows a number of case laws from 2000 to 2013. And as you see, AAA is American Arbitration Association, ICC International Commercial Chamber, which is located in France. LCIA, London Commercial International Arbitration, uh, International Arbitration uh, which is located in uh, uh, London, England. JCAA is located in Tokyo and Osaka, which is, of course, in Japan. So Hong Kong International Arbitration is here. CTAC is a Chinese arbitration institution, the biggest one, I think. So CIAC is a Singapore International Arbitration Center. As you see the number, Please look at the Japan, all the way below here. So uh, if you can take a look at glance, uh, JCAA has either just one digit or lower two digits, uh, at maximum of 26 cases, dealing with international arbitration uh, annually. So um, I could say that Japan would be very behind as a place of arbitration. And uh, we'd like to know why, because actually this kind of uh, status continues from 1950s. There are no changes. But please note that it doesn't mean that the Japanese companies wouldn't go out and do arbitration. 
big company, uh, largely speaking, they know how to conduct arbitration. I mean, Western style arbitration. So that the uh, problem is small, medium companies or consumers or some other uh, people who are not familiar with the arbitration system, I mean, the uh, rule of law based arbitration system, if they know arbitration system, I think that they have a benefit from using the arbitration. Actually, I'm not here to promote arbitration, but arbitration works. It is uh, usually consensual, it is effective, it is efficient, probably not expensive if you use properly, and uh, most importantly, you can enforce arbitral award in many countries, more than 160 countries, I guess, under the New York Arbitration Convention, which would make it different from litigation. If you use litigation first, you have to go through two threshold questions. First is about jurisdiction, and uh, second is uh, enforcement of foreign judgment. To do business solidly and safely, you need certainty in expecting the outcome of uh, litigation or outcome of dispute, and also the beginning how to praise the litigation without violating a due process. It depends on the sovereignty. They know what to do, but they sometimes act unexpectedly. So the arbitration master these issues. So arbitration is not versatile, but arbitration works to some extent. So that the GDP ranked third right now, how come Japan cannot serve as place for arbitration I'm really interested in? Actually, I have been following this scene for 20 years, and uh, there is a chance to change the scene, such as the new arbitration law was promulgated after Anstor Motor Law, and I was kind of glad to know that, and I tell everybody, hey, probably Japan would be uh, the place for arbitration. Everybody should study arbitration, apply the law outside of court, and if you have expertise, you have a chance to make a living there. But that is not business. Of course, it's not business, but I thought that the opportunity for next generation, since I'm now joining the faculty member, I'd like to promote the market, or I'd like to introduce what they can do in the future from that perspective. I think that arbitration is very attractive. So, but again, I'm not here to promote arbitration. Litigation has some aspect in certain, certain area of the dispute must be resolved in litigation such as an uh, um, intellectual property area, sometimes need uh, uh, arbitration, uh, I mean litigation, I'm sorry, rather than arbitration. So next. So our uh, issue here is whether, and if so, to what extent, international commercial arbitration in Japan might accommodate the Western style arbitration and hybrid process arbitration. We take a look at the, these contents. First, uh, we like to look at briefly, very briefly, the legal system of Japan, and uh, which produced the role of law, and the role of contract, and the role of lawyers, and also the lack of language skills, which is a huge problem, I guess, and a dispute resolution culture in Japan, which looks like all of these ingredients to provide unique Japanese dispute resolution culture. Everybody is uh, uh, tired of listening to the uh, statement, hey, Japan is unique. Maybe not, but from the viewpoint of Western nation, or from the viewpoint from even China, I think that Japan is unique, or because they don't share the information of their policy to which direction they want to go in certain area, we may not properly or fairly judge how Japan acts in arbitration or which way Japan would like to go in terms of arbitration. So having said that, we're going to move on to law and the practice of international commercial arbitration in Japan, which will be shaped by these ingredients. So uh, to conclude, 
I don't know why it's not conclusion, but it's preliminary conclusion, at least at present time, to answer the issue I provided in the previous slide. So let's begin. So this is a map I like most. And uh, if uh, you just you know, uh, hide this part and I ask the students, hey, what kind of map is this? They said, well, maybe the red part, uh, the car drives right side, something like that. <laughs> but actually, in, uh, in uh, pursuing the comparative study, I'm, in terms of law, the scholars or the practitioners sometimes divide the world map into uh, several categories of the legal traditions. So uh, blue region represents for the civil law, and uh, kind of brown areas of common law, and Hong Kong is a common law. So uh, there is kind of mixed jurisdiction, like uh, uh, Louisiana in the United States, and uh, Toronto in Canada, and there is some customary law, and also Sharia law. If you may add, you may add uh, socialist law, but the uh, problem is that labeling is useful. But if you take a look at the legal system from inside, maybe the Professor Ito here always discussed that, hey, Japan might not be, or he said, Japan is not a uh, civil law country. Is that right? No comment. OK. <laughs> because uh, we are influenced by the United States legal system, especially after World War II. So, uh, uh, but at least it is useful to uh, uh, what we, uh, we should look at as a uh, characteristics or traits the people from a different legal tradition have. So if uh, somebody is sitting across a table, I mean a negotiation table, and uh, they are from a, a common law country, what do you ask, expect? We are from a civil law country, so uh, we don't know the distinction between the common law and the equity. So uh, if uh, we put uh, this clause such as, uh, in case of breach of contract, we would like to have remedies at law. Then we see low country people think that at low means including injunction, specific performance, and some kind of equitable remedies. But from the perspective of common law lawyers, hey, why don't you put the word at equity? Otherwise, we're going to lose the uh, with less or remedies in the area of uh, equity. So uh, make sure that if the applicable law is common law, you have to put law and equity, and that's a very important distinction. But from the perspective of dispute resolution, if I use this like this, this kind of a rough draft so that uh, somebody else must uh, argue that, hey, jury system, no jury system, we have jury system in the criminal law, but are not civil law, but uh, uh, please uh, just uh, allow me to just you know, uh, skip that details. If uh, you consider the dispute resolution matters, and especially the arbitration right now. These three underlying aspects might affect the number of the arbitration in your country. Arbitration probably is an alternative dispute resolution to litigation, so that if you don't like jury system, you can just get out. You can just agree in the contract to remove the jury system, but it's up to the jurisdiction to enforce that kind of clause. So that, uh, to avoid that risk, you just move out of court and agree to arbitrate. So you don't need to be subject to Jewish system. Discovery system. The United States is renowned or infamous for a broad range of discovery system, therefore. But if you'd like to you know, remove it, or if you'd like to not subject to it, just go to arbitration. Sometimes if the arbitrator is from common law countries, still they insist on some kind of discovery system, which they are familiar with in the United States. But you can control that uh, either citing the IBA uh, rule, or maybe that I don't recommend, but you can just contract it out, or you can adjust it by contract class. Punitive damages, uh, sometimes uh, in the United States, Federal Arbitration Act allow the punitive damages to be offered by uh, uh, arbitrators, but some jurisdictions not. But you don't like the punitive damage in your jurisdiction, you can, f you can just uh, choose the place of arbitration where the arbitrator cannot issue punitive damage award. 
So that kind of uh, um, strategy, escaping from litigation, you can just uh, uh, engage in arbitration. So if you put that into the USA-Japan relationship as representative of common law being USA and as representative of civil law being Japan, everybody probably has heard before USA is a religious society and Japan is no religious society. I don't know about it because I have lots of people, I'm a lawyer, so that everybody comes for suing somebody. <laughs> so I don't know about it. I'm following some uh, uh, statistics and also uh, kind of a, um, data, but I can't really tell if this description is right or not. So whenever I see foreign people from foreign countries, I'm asking them, your country, are you going to sue neighbors? So um, my friend from Germany said yes, my friend from China said yes, and my friend from Singapore said yes, my friend from Hong Kong said yes. My friend from Japan said yes too. So I don't know uh, if uh, this is right or not, but this is kind of a stereotype uh, which we have to kind of follow. I don't know if we should follow or not. But if I, you are not religious country, it is said that arbitration is popular in a jurisdiction where the ma many, many litigations are filed. So the number of litigation probably show that there is a tendency to go for arbitration because a smaller version or I would say a less official version of litigation you'd like to do out of court. If you're religious, you better go to arbitration uh, if uh, that is your constraint. If you go to litigation, you don't need to pay judges. You don't need to pay the place for arbitration so that there may be some cost effectiveness. But if you would like to Avoid uh, uh, publicity, you definitely go to arbitration. You can keep confidentiality. So religiousness might link to the number of arbitration in that jurisdiction. So how about the role of law? Actually, what is the law in Japan? And uh, Darin David, who is a very famous company law professor, described Japanese law in 1985 in his book like this. There is a, uh, harmony is, is clearly not suited to or even in harmony with present Japanese social laws. So what the law is doing there? So there might be some uh, distance from the law and also the Japanese people's real life. We post the law if uh, your liver is uh, arrested or some criminal matter, or if uh, your human right uh, violated, you first think about law. In the regular course of life, you don't really want to be related to law. So, or they disregard law at all. I can feel that. So, I don't know that my feel is not the representing the Japanese people's all, but. Uh, this would be, uh, uh, I agree with this description in 1985 when I was a graduate student, no, undergraduate student. I believe it was so. How about now? This is a statement still on the website on the Japanese government. The Justice System Reform Council, they issued this statement in 1999. And I said, they have to just, you know, give the flesh and blood to the law of a nation. So that being that law, even existing, will not be a tool to vindicate the rights. So that a Japanese government would like people to know, hey, there is a law. So you have to stick with it. Otherwise, you lose a chance to survive in the 21st century society. So it was 1999, and after this, actually this statement was starting to implement it to be implemented, and uh, which will be reflected in 2003 new arbitration law, and also the uh, incorporation of the US legal system starting from 2004. Reflecting and also uh, considering that aspect of law into consideration, what could be the role of contract in Japan? 
It is said, and uh, I agree too. They create or they enter into contract not to create legal relationship, but to establish business relationship to be developed in the future. So that that is contract itself is just a symbol of just starting the relationship, not preparing an expectation lawsuit or dispute resolution. They don't think it could be used as evidence to be submitted to the court. It could be linked to the non-religiousness of Japanese people too. If you think that you know the people from neighbors would, would sue you, you might be really careful. But uh, it's going to take a lot of time to review the, all the contracts and all that. But still, even the big Japanese company exchanged the uh, draft of a uh, contract. It consists of only one to three pages or so. Because we are from civil law countries. If uh, you go to court and a problem arises and it's uh, deemed to as a legal problem, statute applies and court gives the answer. So that lawyers are not familiar with negotiating contract. If uh, you go to the United States and work for some company, and if you see the personnel at the legal department, they are licensed as a lawyer. They know how to deal with contract. They know how to draft the contract. They know how to interpret the law. So uh, they know the thick contract must be prepared. If uh, you know the parole evidence rule and all that, if uh, you don't put everything in a contract which has the entire agreement clause, and uh, if uh, you like to introduce something existing before the uh, en entrance of that contract and the signature of that contract is put, you cannot really actually introduce some kind of uh, evidence which would add something to the entire agreement or which might have something um, discri discriminatory effect or a different effect. You can really just confuse the jury about it. So that kind of aspect, I don't feel from uh, my, at least my friend who engaged in domestic practice uh, in Japan as a lawyer, I'm always asked to uh, translate that document into English. It's very difficult to find uh, appropriate terminology from Japanese law to English law. But uh, I anyway, do that. And at the same time, I always suggest, hey, why don't you just put this word and uh, in the notification clause and uh, you need this and that and that. They said, don't worry about it, Ricky. Well, I have to be responsible for that, so uh, please just to give me the waiver. So I don't want you to get a waiver for just translating the contracts, so that if you registered as a foreign lawyer in Japan in a civil law country, and if a translation would be, you think, uh, make your living, be careful. It's very difficult, and it comes back to you. It bites back to you. So translation is good, but I don't recommend just doing translation and make a living as a foreign lawyer in foreign countries, okay? So uh, contract is not to uh, be used as evidence in the court. So what is a contract? Uh, there uh, in Japan, contract non-formalism is criticized from academic view. This is very old, 1958, made by uh, <coughs> Professor Merrin. He's also a famous professor. Um, and he said that uh, the signing of a business contract when the parties do not contemplate the regulation of relationship that's initiated by formal legal standards, but rather seek a pattern of continuing association in which adjustment will be responsive to consideration, the law ignores. What kind of law be applied? So uh, he's very confused. And uh, I think that, not directly, but I thought that indirectly it exactly described, I and mean, accurately described the Japanese non-contract formalism. So uh, here's a story just uh, um, issued by Jetro. And uh, this is a very interesting story. So uh, you can just uh, read it. And uh, even though the Japanese signed the contract, which does not mean that they're gonna follow the contract by term by term. So be careful, so uh, be patient. If you go to other jurisdiction, there's no and cultural differences. So uh, if you go to Rome, do as Romans do, 
that tradition still, I think, work. Or even though now the International Technology Society, you can get all the information, and you can just uh, you know, uh, distill some kind of a known from it and uh, uh, stick to it, but that would be very difficult. I would rather take the information from foreign countries to uh, you know, get myself familiar with that custom and culture and make them happy, and I'm happy because I learned it. So that kind of atmosphere, I think we could build the um, legal system which work globally and locally. So uh, if a contract has no formalism, what kind of dispute resolution clause they put in the contract? You might have heard the good faith negotiation clause or gentleman clause, which means that any mothers happen, you're going to just uh, consult or discuss in good faith. Some jurisdiction, if the term is concrete enough, they might give the enforcement power for this, clause, this kind of clause. But uh, in Japan, it is said that otherwise it is meaningless, which means that uh, you can really you know, ignore the contract, you can breach the contract, but uh, if Japanese see the contract as uh, establishment of a business relationship, this kind of clause, to me, makes sense. So the number of attorneys here. As I mentioned before, in 2004, we incorporated the US law school system. So the number of uh, attorneys, uh, they start to take new bar examination from 2007 or so. Before that, annual bar passing number of attorneys, just 800 people per year. But right now, it's about 1,000 to 1,500. So 19, uh, 2015, 36,000 lawyers right now, but still compared to other countries, Japan, the number of people per attorney is 3,000, and other countries such as UK is 406, US is 264. I'm not sure, but if uh, you have more lawyers, there might be a chance to bring the arbitration to Japan, but I'm not sure about that. But anyway, we engage in legal education system simulated with the US system, but I don't know that if that's gonna bring the arbitration to Japan more and more. So Japanese lawyers, as I said, wouldn't participate in a meeting with his clients. They wouldn't do that. And even though they draft the contract and the litigation occurs based on that contract, the lawyer who appeared in court are different lawyers so that they don't exchange the view and that they don't actually improve the, you know, the clause at all, at least to my uh, experiences show. So they are not familiar with negotiating contract. They are probably specialized in negotiating contract or maybe a litigation attorney. So Japanese attorneys sometimes are not familiar with drafting a detailed contract. And that gonna affect the dispute resolution matters in terms of the applicable law and the jurisdictional issues. They don't know that, uh, whether jurisdiction would be a problem or not. Actually, Japan is unitary system. From north to south, you go to anywhere, that single unified way of law interpretation on the law statute applies. But here, Hong Kong, I don't know that you have a relationship with China, and you have a relationship with other countries, it's a big market here, and you are a common law countries, so you know that the jurisdiction is very important, due process is very important, so that first you have to think about lawyers, maybe statute of limitation, then the jurisdictional matters. And uh, in the United States, it has more to it because it has a two layers of a legal system, federal and state. You have to first decide which court you have to file, and also that you have to think about forum non-convenience. Even though you think that you satisfy the requirement to bring some action to certain court against certain defendant, the court, if find 
better jurisdiction, even extraterritorially. They ordered, actually the judge ordered parties to go out there and sue party there. Then if you are not successful, come back here. That kind of uh, uh, judicial power, I think that Japanese uh, judges are not given. So jurisdiction is kind of a um, natural thing to be considered in order to bring action in a common law country, including the United States, and applicable law too. Uh, you have a United States state law and a federal law, and here uh, you have, uh, of course, domestic law and uh, probably CSG, and sometimes UNIDOROA, uh, International Commercial Contract Principles. So applicable law, that I think is a uh, must skill for the next generation Tony to learn how you can just specify the applicable law and put that into the um, contract as a clause to make it enforceable in any courts. So language, sorry, there's a slide kind of uh, omit the part of the topic. It's a lack of uh, language skills. This is made in 2006. This statement that was made by a professor who is actually expertise in arbitration too. And uh, he said, I think that for Japanese, the barrier of foreign language skills is less. And especially where oral communication must be made, such barrier appears too high indeed. In international arbitration, particularly where arbitrators from the common law countries leave the arbitration tribunal, they often insist on oral agreement instead of sticking with the documentation. So for Japanese, even just lawyer's perspective and academic perspective, who's supposed to be a representative or arbitrators in international arbitration, they think language very, very delicate matter. Because as you see the case, if you agree to arbitration process, and uh, arbitrators or you or arbitrary institution determine the use of language in which country, and uh, if uh, you proceed through the arbitration, and uh, you are not satisfied with the arbitration award, there is no redress at all. You cannot really allow the uh, arbitration award. You can't really enforce it in a foreign jurisdiction. So that the language you guys are okay because uh, you are from common law country. You study well, you study law, you read the case, so uh, English is no problem. But uh, unfortunately, English is regular language to be used in arbitration. So that here in Japan, even just uh, top educated, sophisticated professor said, hey, language is a problem. So that if this aspect is conquered or overcome by individual effort, I think that arbitration is still um, popular in Japan, especially as a place of arbitration. Nobody would like to come, you know. They bargaining power matters. The Japanese parties have much more bargaining power. Maybe they have to force you to come down to choose arbitration in Japan. But you don't want to go there because uh, maybe the representative might not know the English languages. So there's a miscommunication, there's no justice, and you can really you know, uh, appeal the arbitration award unless there is a profound defect about procedural matters. So you have to be really careful. And we have to be really careful. So uh, dispute resolution can be like this. Uh, we are non-litigious, no data, no adversary or dispute resolution system. We are said we are from a settlement country, and our legal tradition doesn't like confrontation. Sometimes we do, but um, it, it is just we usually said. So conciliation or settlement in litigation, they respect the judges, they respect the government, they respect the country. So if you like to vindicate the rights, you better do that in front of the you know governmental organization. So this point, common law lawyers, when I was in the United States, I get lots of questions from the US law school students. They are disparate in going to Japan and 
blooming as a famous lawyer and everything he, they can control by contract, what they think. So they asked me, Ricky, um, I learned that in Japan, there's no contract for this. How come we can do the international business? Okay, uh, maybe they ask, they just sign a contract if you just submit the draft. Okay, so I suppose that they sign the draft. Okay, they don't know the, what the arbitration is. So uh, even though they are claimant, they didn't just start the arbitration process. So uh, what do you do? The litigation? No way, litigation, judicial matter, enforcement matter. I don't want to get involved in. Okay, so that's one pattern. So uh, other said that, hey Ricky, if uh, you go conciliation, settlement and litigation, that's fine. Because uh, that sometimes will be confidential. Arbitration can provide a confidential tribunal. Why don't you just agree with it? No, no, no. Arbitration is not popular in Japan. Besides, as I speak to you later, arbitration can be deemed as mediation in Japan. So uh, as a waiver, as I said, many big Japanese companies know Western style arbitration. They probably know better than lawyers. So uh, small, medium companies or maybe a small business personnel, they don't know what the arbitration is. If I translate into Japanese, it means that go into the middle. You can find this kind of definition in the dictionary too. Going to the middle means that you don't determine which loser win. So that kind of a mental or concept or epistemology we regular Japanese would have. So please explain to them what, Japan, what arbitration really is. So let's start from there. So I, at the beginning of the uh, lecture, I said that, that there's a certain stage where the Japanese arbitration scene might bloom. It was 2004 when a uh, new legal education followed after the US Law School came and increasing the number of lawyers a new Japanese Arbitration Act, modeled after Armstrong Model Law, actually promulgated in 2003, effective in 2004. And also CSG belated, it, was, it became effective August 2009. Okay, we can go for it international. We can just uh, invite lots of people who like to arbitrate cases in Japan. But it really wouldn't happen. Um, enactment of the modern westernized arbitration law itself was not the cause of the dust I see in Japan. As I put in a, a chart, even after 2004, there's no radical change in the number of arbitration. And you might say, uh, how about ad hoc arbitration, not using institutional arbitration? Well, it is reported that from the uh, person in expertise in that area, there are a few ad hoc arbitration because of the dif difficulties in administration of arbitration proceeding. Yet, uh, some are, but uh, ad hoc arbitration would not be required to take into account when I just speak about modern Western arbitration itself is not cause of the dust that I see in Japan. So everybody said law is not a problem. It's a problem, it's a practice. It is also uh, pointed out in a uh, Tony Cole, an article written by the American practitioners and a professor. So, as I said, maybe if I, you put in the world, arbitration for regular Japanese people would be defined as impliedly consented made in error. When you agree to arbitrate, you go proceed to arbitration, but your mind expect arbitrator will go into middle. They don't decide a case. They will just have it settle, have dispute resolution, have dispute settle into some point. But it is not. Actually, China has a mid R. But in China, if they agree to arbitrate, and then they agree to mediation, then mediation fails, then they proceed to arbitration. In Japan, 
probably the people think that go straight to mediation in a process of arbitration. So they think that arbitrators would function as mediators from the front. So uh, arbitration, arbitrators can be only used to transform a mediator settlement into consent and work. But if you are appointed as arbitrator, you don't want to settle the case. They can say no. So I don't know how it can just turn out in the international context, but here I think that I can describe Japanese arbitration like this. So uh, law and practice of I say in Japan, why it is like implied consensual, um, excuse me, implied consensual mean in our. So it is a, because non conference culture, everybody's just attribute that aspect to Confucianism. I'm not sure, but I feel that I can just, you know, uh, I myself is very happy people. So I don't like confrontation. So, um, and also the hierarchical society. Japan is a very top-down society in a sense. So uh, uh, people prefer judge to an arbitrator. They would like to have governmental power to be involved if uh, your rights and obligations are related. And it's bureaucratic society too. And that's why they prefer a judge to an arbitrator. I mean the private arbitrator. So uh, we saw that uh, no rule of law in the Western sense. Hey, here is a law, vindicate the rights under this law, you are wrong and right. That kind of concept we don't have. And uh, uh, accordingly, no contractual proxy in the Western sense. And 1986, before this year, Japanese arbitration at JCAA was severely criticized as implied consensual meeting hour because uh, U.S. attorneys who participated as a representative there, actually he couldn't represent because he was actually the, uh, the advisor. Japanese law doesn't allow the foreign lawyer to represent uh, uh, parties in arbitration conducted in Japan. So in 1986, they just opened the market to the foreigners. So uh, before that, there sometimes all arbitrators are Japanese, represent throughout Japanese. So they bring the way they conduct the litigation in court, and that technique was brought to uh, arbitration process. So they are from the settlement culture. So the judge would like to settle the case. Uh, lawyers would like to settle the case. So they don't produce winner or loser. So they are critically, critically criticized by uh, American lawyers. But that kind of a process right now do not exist, hopefully. But lately, still, if the arbitrators are Japanese and the representatives are Japanese, the parties are Japanese, still implied consensual meeting the art is in practice. OK, so we wait. Should I just uh, skip? And uh, I just uh, gave you a handout. And on handout, there are a table showing or just demonstrating what I described in my slide. For example, that in 2005, uh, it has a 2005 data and a one year data. It just uh, uh, sent a questionnaire to thousands of companies who uh, opened their stock to the public. And they said that important methods to resolve domestic disputes. Top three ranked uh, choice was made and 20.7% is mediation and 9.2% is arbitration for domestic disputes. So that reflects the, reflect the settlement culture of Japanese dispute resolution. How about the international, oh, sorry. Oops. Sorry, this one should be the international, international dispute. Total is mediation is 70% and arbitration is 41.2%. That reflects that Japanese companies no. International dispute resolution arbitration better handles. So 41.2% choose arbitration. And this one is a 2008 JCAA research. 
and I just participated as one of the academics to do research on the Japanese arbitration market. And uh, um, only 200 some companies, just about 300 companies gave us an answer. But they said that they put, uh, they are prepared to put arbitration clause in their own agreement. And uh, some said a jurisdictional clause, which means the uh, venue and the jurisdiction, and some said no clause. But this research was led by the manager of the JCAA, Katsuya Nakamura. He said that even though they put arbitration clause, nobody actually this arbitration and seriously negotiate arbitration clause. So that just because uh, arbitration clause was there does not mean the Japanese people know how to arbitrate. Then I said a small and medium company might have some problem. There is a data in 2013 conducted by JCAA Osaka office and that small and medium company who actually has a business relationship with Southeast Asia. And 328 companies are selected, 117 companies or large companies. And preparation of written contract, actually they prepare the written contract. And uh, uh, so 238 all, 159 companies actually prepare contract by itself, which is good. So small medium company knows uh, how to draft the contract a little bit, but prepared by the other party and just signed, 52 companies did that, just signed. So uh, without going through the contract, they just signed the contract. And much more worse, no written contract prepared, which is 62 companies. So still, the, I would say that Japanese would see the contract as an um, important tool to vindicate their rights in business. And how about the dispute resolution clause? 84 companies actually put dispute resolution clause, and uh, uh, that could be the arbitration, which is 97. However, as I said, small and medium-sized companies they wouldn't know, actually they wouldn't know how to just uh, uh, negotiate the arbitration clause. But that would be changing in the near future. Surely the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center last month came to Japan, hold the center, and they actually raised the issue of hybrid process. And they actually instruct us through the kind of uh, mock arbitration or mock negotiation how to construct the hybrid process arbitration clause. It was never done that in the United States too, because in the United States, it was said that simple is better. Arbitration clause, if you like to go to arbitration, just stick with the arbitration clause offered by the arbitration institution which you're gonna use. If you in detail negotiate arbitration clause, and I use some kind of arbitration institution, there might be a discrepancy between the rules of international arbitration institutions and also the contracts. So that gonna just uh, take place, disputes over dispute clause, dispute resolution clause, which I don't recommend. So I don't know the hybrid process is way to go, but I'm sure that we, uh, we, we, are, we have a right to say what we want so if hybrid process reflects a settlement culture that you are comfortable with and your clients are comfortable with, I think that we should stick with hybrid process arbitration clause. But, but arbitration, hybrid process arbitration clause actually involve lots of issues though, which I don't just refer to. So according to the recent surveys, our observation preliminary would be like this. Um, you can just read through rather than just you know, listen to my voice for 19 years old. Um, so I just like to emphasize that Japanese parties would think that arbitration may be the same as mediation. See? And also, uh, I repeat, Japanese companies, especially small and medium corporation companies, 
with few international business experiences, have started to realize the importance of arbitration. They started to realize. And this is a brand new news. Um, for 2020 Olympic, Japanese government decided to support establishing the uh, International Arbitration Center in Tokyo, and also the International Mediation Center in Kyoto. So that maybe they think about a hybrid process working between Tokyo and uh, Kyoto. So we uh, shall see how it goes. So to answer the issue, finally, Japan would not be able to accommodate the Western style arbitration and hybrid process mainly due to the lack of knowledge of the contemporary international commercial arbitration and the Japanese cultural resistance to both adjudication and arbitration's coercive process for resolving this issue. And the lack of practical English language skills of Japanese legal professionals right now. And especially for hybrid process, I, we actually cannot separately conduct mediation and arbitration making. Common law countries prefer it because if a mediator serves also as arbitrator, they already know the fact and the weakness of the case in mediation stage. They can't really apply that into the arbitration stage because uh, it kind of violates the due process. Because in mediation, the other party might not have the cross-examination opportunity if uh, the mediator employed the uh, uh, process of caucus. So, and also the Japanese party may feel the mediation process to be coercive because uh, in Japan, if I use a mediation, which usually is a conciliation and a settlement in litigation in court, so they might feel that you know, if a mediation do some kind of evaluative mediation style, they might think that they have to follow. So uh, that kind of aspect, we have to study more and uh, teach the next generation, hey, mediation is a consensual process. You don't need to actually follow what the mediator suggests as a you know, settlement point. And uh, uh, so they are not private person. If uh, uh, they are private person, so they might not trust the mediators either. So that's a problem too. Well, I'm sorry that I just consumed 90 minutes, and I hope that uh, there might be some questions from audiences. But that's going to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Segmentoni. Which uh, this is, I think, a very interesting presentation, which tells us not only about arbitration and arbitration in Japan, but also the Japanese legal system and Japanese culture and so on. So uh, I think it's a very, um, very informative and stimulating seminar. Uh, we still have, uh, I think, maybe <laughs> at least 15 minutes for some questions and answers. Would you like to answer each question individually, or should we collect a few questions? Oh, um, it depends. I accept everything. Please, it's open to you. So. Anyone like to start? Uh, well, please, any comment as well? Yes, please. Uh, may I raise a question? Uh, because <coughs> it's quite surprising, uh, the number of cases uh, dealt with by the JCCAA, um, because uh, Japanese is an open economy and doing business with uh, foreign companies, yes. um, we would expect that there are a large number of disputes arising from their business relationship, uh, which should be dealt with by the legal system. And if uh, arbitration is not an effective way to uh, deal with it, um, would there be pressure on the part of uh, either the government or the, uh, or the commercial sector to, to do something? Um, because uh, apparently Japan also wants to uh, attract foreign investors and do business with um, the outside world. Uh, is there any pressure to do something on it? And what are the response from the government uh, okay. to do something? It's a great question. Thank you very much for your question. Actually, the, the Japan finally determined, I mean, the Japanese government finally determined to support establishment of the Japanese arbitration center in Tokyo. It's a, it's a private organization, of course. Uh, I'm just a private. 
But uh, actually, Japanese government were indifferent to arbitration system. They raised arbitration as necessary in a judicial reform, but uh, they actually wouldn't support financially. And uh, toward 2020, I think that it is the uh, companies who push the government to support arbitration. But uh, I don't have any evidence, so it, this is my personal view. But following the arbitration theme for 20 years, I don't see the Japanese government seriously push the uh, companies or industries, some sectors, to engage in arbitration. But financial, as financial industry and also the construction industry, they frequently use arbitration. JCAA usually uh, deal with commercial arbitration. So uh, if you go to some sectors which Japanese government find it very important, I think that uh, there might be some pressure for someone to promote arbitration and uh, uh, engage in out of court settlement or dispute resolution. I hope that I can answer the question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other? Please. Yes. Uh, professor, I have a question. And I'm interested in the development, future development of ICA. It seems from your lecture that uh, ICA is quite immature now. Mm -hmm. So what do you expect in relation to the future development and what you, you, know, you think will be a future of ICA? I see that, I know that ICA is important, ICA works. So that if a Japanese people learn it and if they like to use it as case may be, that'll be good. But uh, as a system, I don't see the way, I don't see the future actually. I don't wanna say, but I have a negative view in development of arbitration system in Japan. Because I'm now teaching at the law school, both undergraduate and graduate level. And I like to teach. I also uh, have my uh, seminar students participate in uh, mock arbitration competitions. If I, you know the rule, and I, I think that I, uh, you think arbitration works. But if uh, that cannot be accepted in society, I think the culture is a big thing. Because uh, you don't want to get involved third parties in resolving your own disputes. Negotiation would be the more way I think the Japanese society would like to develop or maybe because um, arbitration is not popular here in Japan, there in Japan, maybe because negotiation skills are very well and also that they always think business plan in advance very carefully so they know the risk and when a risk happens, they know the how to deal with it. There's one article written by the a uh, professor practitioner called uh, Lawrence Newman, who is a lawyer at Tobacco and McKinsey, and he dealt with the Japanese companies. And uh, uh, he put in a footnote, uh, there is a case, and I, I just interpreted it, in, in, I interpreted myself, there's a case uh, where the, maybe the most of people would just uh, bring to the arbitration, but the Japanese people are always prepared to give alternative you know, idea to move the uh, business forward. So that the, maybe the negotiation and a well-prepared business might be the reason why Japanese large companies are not engaged in the arbitration itself. Even if you are claimant, you wouldn't go for arbitration. That kind of uh, data, an article I've read. So that uh, to answer your question, I have a negative view in development of arbitration in Japan because since 1950 till now, I don't see any development and enthusiasm. If I, it grew toward 2020, after that, I don't think it maintained that kind of enthusiasm. So I asked the people who are involved in this project to promote arbitration and mediation in Japan, uh, what are you doing and uh, for who you are doing? They said for everybody, I agree. But we need to prepare person who, who actually construct or who actually form that kind of society. Um, 
I think uh, arbitration works. It's great. But at the same time, that if uh, arbitration award is made, most of the time it's not published. So that uh, in order to study arbitration, you have to really be involved in arbitration society. So uh, that's a very difficulty I always face in uh, uh, preparing the lecture and all that. And I, I escaped from uh, just introducing the cases this time. Because cases always uh, talk about the negative aspect of arbitration. You know, the announcement of arbitration award, arbitrators get bribed, and uh, enforcement is not uh, allowed. So uh, if, uh, unless problem arises, arbitration could just go surface of the earth. But we have to go into that. And I would have to interview the personnel, but they have a confidential agreement or they have a duty to keep confidence. So it's very difficult. But for next generation, I think we need it. Even in Japan, it's an aging society. So now we have to just either go out to seek market or invite lots of foreigners from uh, foreign countries. So we have to deal with the disputes between domestic perspective and foreign perspective. So that if I'm educated as an uh, arbitrator who knows the difference in culture, who knows the difference in the value in justice, you can serve as a mediator. You can serve as arbitrators. And also that you are engaged in a certain kind of sector and your expertise in that area, you can serve as an arbitrator. You don't need to go to court. You don't need to get yourself you know, facing the public. So I think that arbitration is very good. And uh, it probably saved the time and uh, it's going to just, uh, uh, some professor published a book that the arbitration, arbitration should be the default of the dispute resolution system. Uh, I don't know about it, but please um, keep in mind that um, arbitration works well, but cultural aspects are very important. Arbitration starts to adjust the culture too, but Japan, at least, has to assert what they want in a dispute resolution system. They just started it. So I have to be really careful listening to it. Then I'd like to just to contribute to the next generation you know, uh, to create a society you know, with no litigious, no arbitration central, but it is a, a harmonious. And a, uh, everybody can have a certainty in a certain area, which is very difficult. But at least arbitration can escape from the uh, litigation, which is very nice. And I hope that uh, arbitration will grow in Japan. But at present time, again, I don't think that will happen. Sorry, I just repeat everything. <laughs> any, any last uh, question or comment? Yes, this one. Uh, you mentioned, the Professor, that a uh, lot of Japanese corporations are quite familiar with yeah. international arbitration proceedings. Uh, I was wondering, what's the state of uh, enforcement of foreign awards in Japan? Are the courts, uh, you mentioned that uh, the Japan is a signatory of the New York Convention, mm -hmm. but in practice, are the courts favorable in yep. enforcing uh, awards against local Japanese companies? The law is friendly to arbitration, but unfortunately there is one case where the JCAA arbitration award was uh, uh, canceled. It's because the arbitrator, uh, in the arbitration award, the party raised one issue. Actually, uh, arbitrator put that as admission of fact, so that the arbitration award was now canceled. But except for that, I don't think that the Japanese court is hostile to arbitration. They study arbitration, they know well. Even though 1928, written by the Supreme Court judge, they know the Western style arbitration, they provide accurate depiction, and they know how it it's convenient and it works. So uh, to answer your question, Japanese court, from judicial perspective, you don't need to worry about anything. They are fair, they can tr you can trust them, I think. Okay, so maybe we will finish here uh, since the time is running out. So may I First of all, thank all of you for attending the seminar, uh, even though uh, there was not much uh, notice before, but uh, we, we still attracted a uh, very significant number of viewers to come. 
And uh, last but not least, uh, we thank Professor Sakamoto for a very interesting thank you very much. seminar. And thank you for the question. I thought you did more time for questions, so I'll prepare for next time. <laughs> thank you.